So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Royal Society for this year's Francis Crick Lecture, which will be given by Dr. Madan Babu Mohan from the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. I'm Biological Secretary of the Society, and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you tonight. The Francis Crick Medal and Lecture are awarded each year for achievements in the fields of genetics, molecular biology, neurobiology, or biological theory, in all of which Francis Crick himself made outstanding contributions. This year's lecturer, Dr. Mohan, is a graduate of the Center for Biotechnology of Anna University in India and received his PhD from Cambridge University. He did postdoctoral research at the National Center for Biotechnology Information at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda before returning to the Laboratory of Molecular Biology to lead a group that investigates cellular regulation at different levels of complexity. The title of his lecture tonight is shown here, Unstructured Proteins, Cellular Complexity and Human Diseases. My pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mohan to you. Thank you for your kind introduction, John, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I feel delighted and honored to be able to deliver the Francis Crick Lecture. And what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes or so is talk to you about unstructured proteins and tell you a little bit about how they contribute to cellular complexity and cause human disease. In the first part of my talk, I'll provide a general introduction, and I'll be discussing what are unstructured proteins, why they matter, and in the second part of my talk, I'll be presenting work from our group which highlights how unstructured proteins contribute to cellular complexity and cause diseases such as cancer and neurodegeneration. And towards the end, I'll be discussing some unpublished work, and I'll also be talking about how disordered proteins fit into the broader context of a quest to understand the evolution of organismal diversity and complexity in nature. Let me start with an analogy. So let's imagine an alien visiting Earth and looks at a race car for the first time and wonders how exactly the race car works. What would the alien typically do? Well, the alien might first dismantle the car, look at all the components of the car in great detail, and try to understand the shapes of the components and also understand how the shapes contribute to the functioning of the car. So looking at uh, the cylindrical shape of a wheel, it tries to understand that the, the shape is important for the car to be able to move on a flat surface and so on. The alien might also then create a, a picture or a diagram or a network of how the different parts interact with each other and also try to understand how the components come together in order to be able to function as a car. For instance, to be able to understand how the wheels are connected to the engine and so on and so forth. So this is essentially an approach that scientists are taking to understanding cells. So what scientists are doing is to understand the shape of proteins at a molecular level and also try to understand how they interact with each other to be able to get a picture of the different biological processes that are carried out in different types of organisms and cells. So the alien's approach to understanding cars can actually be applied to understanding cells. So at one end of the spectrum, there are scientists who study in great detail a single protein or a pair of proteins or a group of proteins and try to elucidate the shape and structure of these molecules. And this has been the cornerstone of being able to design drugs uh, using structures. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are scientists who try to look at uh, how the different proteins in an organism interact with each other without worrying about the shapes of these molecules. So there are high throughput technologies that tell us which proteins can interact with each other but doesn't have information about the shape. And all this information can be represented as a network and such an approach have actually discovered critical proteins called as hubs that are able to interact with many different proteins in a cell and in this manner coordinate and control many different biological processes. So where are we in terms of this pursuit to understand the shapes and interactions? In terms of shapes, we have the molecular details of more than 100,000 different proteins or protein complexes. 
for over 100 different species. So that's the shape of a ribosome, which is a protein complex. And then in terms of interactions, we have binary information, whether two proteins interact or not, for more than a million different experimentally validated interactions from different proteins from over 30 different species. So this picture here essentially is the protein interaction network of yeast, where every circle represents a protein, and we do not know the shape, that's why I show this as a circle, and a line essentially represents the interaction between the two proteins. Now, based on the shapes and interactions between the different proteins, uh, scientists have put together and reconstructed a view of how cells carry out different biological processes. So what I'd like to do is to play a short part of a much bigger video that highlights how proteins with different shapes come together in the cell to be able to carry out a particular function and how this is important for being able to carry out different processes. So you'll be seeing in this video um, uh, how the ribosomes come together, makes a protein, and how the protein detaches and finds the right interaction partner and gets taken to a particular location in the cell for it to be able to function. another protein that's doing its job in the cell and so on. Now I'd like to kind of like ask you to imagine another situation. So the same alien now removes all the components in the car that are very well structured and highly ordered. And what it remains with are a bunch of wires. And what it essentially finds are lots of flexible wires that all look highly similar. They take specific shapes but they don't have a precise function. So what would the alien make out of this scenario? Now, this is essentially what some scientists who study proteins came across. So they came across a group of proteins uh, that don't adopt a defined three-dimensional structure. They are extremely flexible, and they can adopt different shapes. And for a long time, it was also unclear whether these disordered proteins or unstructured proteins even have a specific function because they don't adopt defined shapes. And this is going to be uh, the next part of my talk where I'd like to highlight what exactly are unstructured proteins, why they matter, and what kind of functions can they actually perform in a cell. But before I do that, I'd like to take a step back and talk to you about one of Francis Crick's major contributions, which is the central dogma. The central dogma states that the information that is encoded in the DNA needs to be transcribed to make the mRNA, and this information is decoded by the ribosome to make the protein. So if DNA is a blueprint of life, then proteins are the building blocks. So what is a protein? Proteins are polymers of amino acids. Uh, there are 20 different types of amino acids. Some of them are hydrophilic, meaning that they like water, and some are hydrophobic, that they don't like water. And the different genes that are encoded in the organisms code for proteins that differ in the sequence of this amino acid. So if we take two different genes, the differences come in terms of the exact sequence of the amino acids that make up such a protein. And most proteins that have been studied so far typically fold and adopt a defined three-dimensional structure, which is important for function. And one of the reasons why they're able to fold is because of these hydrophobic amino acids that tend to avoid water molecules. And this allows uh, a peptide chain or a polypeptide to, to form a compact shape and adopt a defined three-dimensional structure. And thus, the amino acid sequence of a protein determines its ultimate structure, and what shape it can take can determine its function. Now, if you ask how function is therefore achieved by a protein sequence, the classical paradigm has been that a sequence of amino acid needs to adopt a defined three-dimensional structure, and the precise structure is important for function. And this has been highlighted by the availability of structures of numerous proteins, particularly those of enzymes, uh, that uh, kind of like uh, highlighted the importance of positioning specific chemical groups in spatial proximity to be able to carry out enzyme catalysis. Now, in the last few years, particularly a little over a decade ago, uh, scientists have identified a group of proteins, uh, which are called as unstructured proteins, that um, don't adopt a defined three-dimensional structure. They can take a variety of conformational states, and each one of these different conformations can be important for function. 
So the structure function paradigm is now expanded to include what is called as the disorder function paradigm, where the precise three-dimensional structure uh, is not a requirement for these proteins or polypeptides to carry out their function. Now these disordered regions or disordered proteins are quite prevalent in completely sequenced genomes. So over 40% of the proteins in any eukaryotic genome contains large segments of the proteins that are intrinsically disordered and don't autonomously fold. And many of these proteins and these protein regions have been implicated in diverse human diseases such as cancer and neurodegeneration. And they've also been shown to perform critical functions such as cell division and DNA replication and so on. So what is an intrinsically disordered region? I'll be referring to these as IDRs, or unstructured proteins, synonymously in the rest of my talk. So IDRs, or disordered regions, are protein segments that lack a unique three-dimensional structure, either entirely or in parts. And it is believed that they can sample a variety of these conformational states that are in dynamic equilibrium between each other in their physiological condition. So all the proteins that you can think of uh, can fall into the structural continuum. On one end of the spectrum, you have the ordered regions where a polypeptide segment will adopt a defined three-dimensional structure or a shape. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have the fully disordered protein that can adopt a conformation which is quite flexible and, and different shapes. So why do these proteins don't fold? Well, the answer comes when you plot the mean hydrophobicity of a protein segment against the mean net charge. So for all the folded proteins, you have sufficient hydrophobic amino acids in the sequence that allows them to adopt a compact shape. However, for many of the disordered proteins that have been uh, studied so far, you find that they do not have sufficient hydrophobicity and have a large amount of charged residues and polar residues. And therefore, these polypeptide segments are very well solvated and don't collapse on autonomously into a defined three-dimensional structure. And this is one of the factors that contributes to the inability to fold and take a defined shape or a structure. Now, if they don't take a defined shape or structure, how can they function? Well, the flexibility essentially is the major mechanism by which these proteins function. So one of the major mechanisms by which disordered regions achieve function is through their conformational flexibility. So let's consider this disordered region which adopts a particular shape when it interacts with a protein uh, called the CBP here. And the same region, when it interacts with an enzyme called asparagine hydroxylase, it adopts a completely different conformation. So the conformational flexibility, the fact that it can take different shapes, and therefore, depending on the shape of the interaction partner, it could mediate an interaction or not, and hence regulate the function of the protein to which it binds to, provides this enormous flexibility for disordered regions to bind diverse partners. Now in this manner, these proteins can also act as hubs because the different shapes that they can take can allow interaction with different proteins that can carry out different processes in cells. Within these disordered regions, there are short segments of amino acids called as linear peptide motifs. So these are typically between three and seven amino acids and that can mediate peptide protein interactions. So here's an example of a Kenbox motif, which is a, a, a tripeptide here with a lysine, glutamate, and asparagine, and that can mediate interaction with a particular protein here. Now, if you think about a disordered region of about 30 or 40 amino acids, you can have many such short linear motifs in the same region. And therefore, these disordered segments can act as a scaffold for different proteins to be able to bind to the same protein at different regions using these short linear peptide motifs. So in this manner, these proteins can therefore emerge as hubs in protein interaction networks that could mediate multiple interactions simultaneously or uh, in exclusion. The other major mechanism by which disordered regions contribute to function is uh, by their ability to present certain amino acids uh, that gets chemically modified by enzymes. So certain amino acids due to their flexibility within the disordered region can be seen by enzymes and these enzymes add a certain modification and thus the same protein can now exist in different chemically modified states. And because each one of these chemically modified state is a distinct entity, it can also mediate interactions in a very unique manner. For instance, a modification on this position will now mediate an interaction with one protein, whereas a modification on another position will mediate an interaction with a very different protein. A classic example is the histone fold, where the disordered tail gets heavily modified, and this allows the histone protein to participate in diverse processes, such as transcription, or replication, or repair. 
And even within transcription, depending on the type of modification, you could either activate gene expression or repress gene expression. So the same protein, depending on the modification state, can now uh, perform diverse functions. And in this manner, it could integrate different signaling pathways and carry out the function of a hub. An important feature of linear motifs that I'd like to highlight here is their ability to be able to evolve very, very rapidly. So I'll just highlight this with a, a random toy sequence example. So let's start off with a random sequence that is intrinsically unstructured, which mediates no interactions. Now with one mutation, you don't have much. With two mutations, not much. But within three mutations, you could now actually in, involve or form a linear motif that may mediate a protein peptide interaction. Now within another single motif, you could also evolve a post-translation modification site. So because the motifs and modification sites, which are the functional elements or one of the functional elements within disordered regions, are formed by such a small number of residues, what it means is that new protein interactions can disappear or emerge very rapidly with just a few mutations during evolution. So in the case of cancer cells, within a few mutations or few generations, you could evolve new motifs and completely rewire protein networks. Or during evolution, like in the case of yeast, uh, a single generation or a couple of generations is sufficient to evolve new interaction motifs and new interaction sites and modification sites. And this can give rise to diversity or phenotypic diversity in nature. Now, so far I've spoken to you about how disordered regions contribute to function, but they have also been associated with diseases. Mutations within disordered regions that increase their hydrophobicity or changes in the concentration of proteins with disordered segments have been linked with a number of human diseases uh, associated with protein aggregation, such as neurodegeneration. Classic examples include Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, whose causative agents have intrinsically disordered protein regions or peptides. I also mentioned that many of these uh, uh, disordered proteins emerge as hubs in protein networks simply because they present many of these linear motifs or modification sites. So mutations that introduce a new motif or uh, altered abundances that can now permit these disordered proteins to promiscuously interact with other proteins in the cell purely because these linear motifs are small have also been associated with diseases such as cancer. And the reason is because they essentially end up disturbing the fine balance between the different interaction partners in critical signaling pathways and this can deregulate these signaling pathways giving rise to outcomes that are uh, not beneficial for the survival of the cell. So in one of our research, we were interested in understanding how cells minimize the potentially detrimental effects of disordered proteins. Now, as long as proteins with disordered regions are present in low abundance or present for short periods of time, you have what is called as a desired outcome. And by desired outcome, I mean that the protein remains soluble and it mediates the right protein peptide interaction. Now, however, if the protein is overexpressed, or if the protein remains super stable and is present for much longer than what is required, then you go into the undesired outcome regime. And there, the protein begins to aggregate, and you can now promiscuously interact with other proteins, and hence, you can lead to signaling crosstalk. And what we found in our work was that unlike structured proteins, which are not as tightly regulated, proteins with disordered regions or unstructured regions tend to be tightly regulated at different stages during the lifetime in a cell. And this tight regulation ensures that, oops, sorry. This tight regulation ensures that these proteins are present only for short periods of time and are removed once their function is done and are also present in much lower abundances rather than be overexpressed. And this strategy ensures that um, cells are able to minimize the potentially detrimental effect of disordered protein and at the same time allow their amazing functionality and versatility in terms of being able to interact with diverse proteins via motifs and modifications to be realized in cells. So what I'd like to highlight here is that intrinsically disordered regions are not random linkers or random wires like what the aliens are, but these are fundamental units of protein function. Now IDRs differ uh, very clearly from the structured domains in terms of the kind of sequences that they adopt and the kind of physical chemical properties of these proteins. And this essentially allows these uh, protein segments to evolve very differently, perform functions that are very different, and adopt different conformations, be governed by different molecular forces, and can be formed by completely different kinds of sequences that don't require hydrophobic residues.
This also does not mean that all disordered regions are the same. Just like how, unstructured, uh, how structured domains come in different flavors, disordered proteins also come in different flavors, and they can perform a variety of functions. Some may present binding motifs, others may present post-translation modification sites, or you could have combinations of those, all of which can influence uh, their interaction with the different proteins in the cell, and in this manner uh, affect the regulation or affect the function of their interaction partners and contribute to the functioning of cells. Okay, so with this, I'd like to move to um, the second part of my talk, but I'd like to present two studies from our group. The first study will look at how unstructured proteins contribute to cellular complexity, and the second study will focus on how they cause disease such as cancer. But before I do that, I'd like to spend a slide giving a brief overview of the kind of problems that we work in our lab. Cells are highly regulated at multiple levels of organization, and deregulation of this regulation uh, causes diseases. And thus, one of the big questions that we are interested in our group is to ask how is regulation achieved in cellular systems at distinct levels of organization or complexity? And to this, we place a particular emphasis on how the precise structure and the disordered regions of proteins contribute to the emergence of cellular regulation. So we focus on three distinct levels, the molecular level, the systems level, and the genome level. So at the molecular level, we are interested in understanding functions of uncharacterized proteins or identifying and discovering regulatory features of very important signaling molecules and proteins such as G-protein coupled receptors. At the systems level, we are interested in understanding how the different regulatory processes and proteins come together to maintain cellular homeostasis and how the breakdown of this gives rise to disease outcome. And finally, at the genome level, we are interested in understanding the interplay between gene regulation and, um, uh, and how exactly this influences the ways in which genes and genomes evolve across evolution. All with the ultimate goal of wanting to understand the molecular basis of diseases caused by regulatory dysfunction. So in terms of how we do our research, we employ and develop both traditional computational and experimental approaches, and we try to make as much use as possible of publicly available data to be able to extract knowledge from publicly available data and information. And for this, we make use of information such as sequence, the three-dimensional structure, the expression levels of proteins, and networks, and so on. And we hope to be able to make specific discoveries from mining all this data and also elucidate general principles with the idea that the discovery and the general principles of regulation that we could identify from integrating and mining all this data can be exploited not just in medicine but also in biotechnology application. So with this, I'd like to uh, present the, the first uh, study that we did on how alternative splicing of disordered segments can affect protein interaction networks. So what is alternative splicing? But before I go there, just like how proteins uh, are made up of amino acids, genes are made up of units called as exons. And we saw along the central dogma that the information in the DNA needs to be made into an RNA, and the RNA is what is decoded into a protein. Now, as the first step, uh, the exons are transcribed into the mRNA, and alternative splicing is a process that determines whether an exon gets stitched into the final mRNA or not. So the red exon here is included in one of the mRNAs here, which is what I'll be referring to as isoforms because they come from the same gene, but then they have two different ways in which the exons are stitched together. And in this particular uh, isoform, the red exon is not included. And therefore, when the ribosome decodes, you now have a new segment here that is incorporated into the protein sequence, but this region is not incorporated in this particular isoform. Now, advances in next-gen sequencing technology have clearly revealed that more than 90% of the genes in the human genome are expected to undergo alternative splicing. And it's also been suggested that nearly 50% of the isoforms that have been identified are likely to have tissue-specific distribution, meaning that they are only seen in some tissues but not in the others. Now, at the protein level, what role these uh, segments actually contribute to or play is something that is not fully understood. So given that over 50% of the isoforms are estimated to be tissue specific, we were interested in two specific questions. What is unusual about these segments that are included or excluded only in some transcripts and in some tissues? How can inclusion or exclusion of these short segments contribute to or influence protein function? Now to address this problem, we first systematically compiled 
uh, multiple large-scale data sets that described the transcript isoforms from 10 different human tissues. So these were the tissues from which the uh, RNA uh, and isoform information was available. And then what we did was to characterize the units of the gene, the exons, into three different categories. Okay? So let's take this toy example of a gene that has five exons. The exon that is shown in light gray is made into, uh, uh, can makes it into the, both the isoforms in the brain. It is also included in both the isoforms in the liver. So this gray exon, light gray exon, is always included in all the isoforms that is expressed irrespective of the tissue. So these are what I'll be referring to as constitutive exons because they're always included. The dark gray exons are included in one isoform but not in the other, but there's no tissue specificity. You also <coughs> see them in the brain, you also see them in the liver. So these are what I'll be referring to as alternative exons. So these are isoform specific, but do not show any tissue specificity. Now the exons that are shown in red are included in one isoform, but not in the other, but this only happens in one tissue. It only happens in brain, but not in the liver. So these are what I'll be referring to as tissue specific exons. Those that are isoform specific and are also specific to a particular tissue. Now once we had this information, we then looked at the structural properties of these protein coding segments. And what we found was that tissue specific exons tend to have a much higher number of uh, um, uh, amount of disordered regions compared to the constitutive exons, which more often tend to have structured domains with defined biochemical properties. Now in terms of the kinds of features that were embedded in these disordered regions, such as linear motifs or post-translation modification sites, we again noticed that tissue specific protein segments are enriched to contain these binding motifs and modification sites compared to the constitutive exons. So this raises the question, how do uh, tissue specific disordered segments affect the function of the corresponding protein? Well, one obvious way by which they could uh, affect protein function is by affecting the kinds of interactions that happen in one tissue but not in the other. Now in the interest of time, I'd like to just present some of the general principles that we observed or the general patterns that we observed from mining these large data sets. The first general uh, observation that we could make is that tissue specific splicing tends to affect disordered regions with linear motifs and this can create new protein interactions. So here is an example of a protein phosphatidyl inositol phosphate 5 kinase. The isoform that is expressed in the brain includes a disordered tail that presents a peptide motif and therefore the AP2 protein can bind to uh, the PIP5K gene via this motif. However, the isoform that is expressed in the lymph node does not include this disordered tail and therefore even though AP2 protein is expressed in both the different tissues, in one tissue you have an interaction and in the other tissue you do not have an interaction. So you could rewire protein interaction networks not by removing structured domains but by removing short unstructured segments that can present binding motifs. Now the second general observation is that tissue specific splicing tends to affect disordered regions with modification sites that I described. And this can therefore create new substrates for important molecules such as signaling enzymes like kinases or other kinds of molecules. So the example that I'd like to take you through involves the Paxson 2 gene. The isoform that is expressed in the breast tissue includes a disordered tail that presents the uh, modification sites for casein kinase. However, the isoform that is expressed in the brain does not include this disordered uh, region and therefore even though casein kinase is expressed in both these tissues, in one tissue you recruit this protein as a substrate and in the other tissue even though a version of the protein is expressed, you do not recruit this uh, protein as a substrate. So you could rewire signaling interactions again in a tissue specific manner, not by affecting structured domains but by affecting short disordered tails that expose these peptide motif and hence can regulate the function of the protein via these modifications. Now more often than not, we also identified situations where more than one isoform is expressed in the same cell type and this can give rise to very interesting properties and phenomena. So I'll just take you through another example which involves uh, P53. Full length P53 has at least three major uh, domains. The N terminal region is the unstructured region which is called as the activation domain. So the unstructured region interacts with the transcriptional machinery and that's how it is able to recruit the transcriptional machinery and activate gene expression. The DNA binding domain binds to the DNA uh, upstream of promoter regions of specific genes and the tetramerization domain allows P53 to form a tetramer, four molecules come together to form the active unit. So in this manner, 
the tetramerization domain brings together the four molecules of P53. The DNA binding domain allows them to bind to the promoter region of the DNA, and the unstructured activation domain uh, recruits the transcriptional machinery to activate gene expression. In embryonic stem cells, there are two different isoforms of P53 that are simultaneously expressed in the same cell type when the cell needs to make a decision to differentiate. So the isoform that is expressed now contains the DNA binding domain and the tetramerization domain. However, it lacks the unstructured activation domain. And what this essentially means is that you could still bind DNA, you could still form a tetramer, but you're not going to be able to recruit the activation, mesh, uh, the trans transcriptional machinery. And therefore, you have converted an activator to a repressor, not by removing structured domains, but by removing disordered tails that can uh, uh, interact with uh, uh, other transcriptional machinery to be able to regulate gene expression. So the expression of more than one isoform in the same cell type leads to sequestration where you can now sequester full length P53 into non-functional complexes. I could also compete for the same sequence on the DNA. So the same set of genes that were once now activated by full length P53 can now be shut down by expressing an isoform of P53 that does not contain this disordered transactivation domain, but still contains the structured DNA binding domain and the tetramerization domain. Okay, so in summary to this part of the talk, what I'd like to highlight is that tissue-specific splicing of disordered regions can increase the functional versatility of proteins by rewiring protein interaction networks. And the differential inclusion of these disordered segments can rewire protein networks, which is what I've shown in this cartoon. The red exon includes in, uh, included in one isoform makes it as a disordered region in the protein and therefore can mediate protein peptide interaction. But the isoform, uh, which does not include this tissue-specific segment, even though the two proteins may be expressed in the same cell type, you do not have an interaction between these two proteins. So the differential inclusion of these unstructured regions can change the context in which the biochemical function of the protein is carried out. For instance, the kinase will still be a kinase. It's still phosphorylate a protein. But which protein gets recruited as a substrate can be now determined by these disordered regions that can present itself with modification sites and hence rewire signaling networks and contribute to increased cellular complexity in different tissues. So to go back for uh, an analogy among the Lego fans of us, so you can use the same components but how you put together these components can give rise to functional diversity, very much like some of these protein networks that I was showing you early on in the slides. So in addition to our group, there were a number of other uh, groups that um, published similar observations in different cell types, different organisms, uh, and also in different tissues, all of which essentially highlights the power of how uh, disordered regions have been reused in more than one way and one context to be able to rewire protein networks and thereby contribute to increased cellular complexity in naturally occurring organisms and cell types. Okay, I'll now move on to the second study that we performed, which is on how unstructured proteins can contribute to disease such as cancer. Specifically, I'd like to focus on how gene fusion involving disordered segments can affect protein interaction networks. Now, gene fusion is a, a phenomena uh, by which two different genes that may reside on two different chromosomes or two different parts on the DNA come together by a process called as translocation, and this results in the creation of a chimeric gene where one part of the parent gene makes it into uh, the fusion gene and the other part of the parent gene makes it into the fusion gene. Now, if you go along the central dogma, you make the fusion transcript, and if you make a protein, you also end up making a fusion protein where one part of the protein comes from one parent and the other part of the protein comes from a different parent. Now, since the first characterization of gene fusions from as early as 1980s, there have been more than 7,000 different gene fusions that have been documented in diverse cancer types by many different groups and many different studies. But despite this, we still do not fully understand how exactly the fusion product uh, can influence uh, the function of the protein or can deregulate protein networks and thereby cause or contribute to diseases such as cancer. So the problem that we became interested in is that with these thousands of documented gene fusion events in diverse cancer types that we now have access to, what is unusual about this fusion product? Can we learn something about these fusion products by looking at what kind of proteins are made? And how exactly do these fusion products influence the kind of protein networks that they may participate in and contribute to disease? Now to study this problem, we systematically compiled multiple large-scale data sets from individual studies by different groups that have been published for a very long time. 
We also made use of uh, uh, large-scale studies that looked at uh, diverse human cancer cell lines and identified gene fusion events that um, can cause cancer. And we also made use of data that were available from large consortia, such as the Cancer Genome Atlas and so on. And for every fusion product that was detected in a, in a cancer cell, we then trace back and ask what was the parent protein, which part of the parent protein got included into the fusion product, and which part of the parent protein got excluded from the protein product. And we further classified the parent genes into those that are oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and other parent genes, meaning that these could cause cancer or could potentially suppress cancer, uh, and for which we don't have information about their uh, nature of function. Now the first observation that we made when we looked at the uh, number of interaction partners that these parent protein makes in normal cells is that they tend to be hubs in protein interaction network. So proteins that have been detected in this fusion tend to normally make a large number of connections in normal healthy cells. And what this essentially means is that any perturbation to these parent proteins will likely affect a significant part of the protein interaction network that they may normally participate in. Now we also observe that the parents of the fusion protein tend to contain large amount of disordered regions that present linear motifs and that also have modification sites. So these are the non-parent genes and these are the other parent genes and you can see that they have uh, elevated numbers of disordered regions, linear motifs and modification sites. And again, in the interest of time, I'd like to present a couple of general uh, observations that we made, which we call as general principles that we could identify. The first one is the following. <coughs> the parent genes tend to lose or gain these linear motifs and modification sites as a result of this fusion. Okay? Now, I'd like to take you through this example of the FLE1 oncogene and the Ewing sarcoma oncogene. Now, this has a structured domain which can bind to the DNA and it also has a disordered region that has a particular modification called ubiquitination. This modification decides whether the protein remains in the cell or is degraded. Now, in the second gene, you have a disordered region that can act as a transactivation domain, but it also has a regulatory region where it has multiple modifications such as ubiquitination that controls whether this protein should be expressed in the cell or should it be degraded. Now, the fusion product takes one part of this gene and it takes the other part of this gene. So you have a DNA binding domain and you have a disordered region that acts as a transactivation domain. However, you have completely lost the ability to regulate this fusion product. So what this fusion has essentially done is to permanently escape cellular regulation because there's no way by which you could control the abundance of these proteins via standard modification uh, such as ubiquitination. So it's like turning on a switch but not be able to turn it off completely. So fusion products in cancer that we identified appear to lose critical uh, post-translation modification and in this manner they end up escaping cellular regulation and thus their function can no longer be regulated and therefore it's like having them completely deregulated in the cellular environment. Now let's take another scenario. So where we have in a normal healthy cell, protein A interacts with protein B and under normal conditions you do not expect and protein B and C to interact with each other. However, when you have a fusion between A and C, what this ends up doing is that you now bring together two proteins that normally don't see each other or should not see each other in a cellular environment in close proximity to each other and force an interaction between these two proteins. So what we observe as a second general uh, observation is that fusion tends to preferentially join proteins with no previous connections in these protein interaction networks. So in this manner, what fusion products end up doing in cancer is to permanently rewire and disrupt critical signaling and regulatory proteins and thus cause large-scale deregulation of signaling or regulatory networks, potentially thereby contributing to uh, um, outcomes such as cancer. So in summary to this section, what I'd like to highlight is that gene fusion uh, ends up resulting in a permanent rewiring of protein interaction networks and the escape of cellular deregulation, that is the inability to control these products and also this permanent rewiring of these hub proteins uh, can alter the topology of signaling and, and regulatory networks, thereby causing disease. So that's what is shown here in this cartoon example where you have normally gene A making certain interactions, gene B making certain interactions, but now when you fuse these two products, you bring together two different parts of the network that typically don't see each other and thus contribute to disease outcomes. <laughs>
So going back to the, uh, uh, the Lego analogy, it's like using the same components, but now you randomly glue these components together such that you can't uh, remove them, and this severely restricts the functional versatility and also brings together certain components that may not normally uh, um, uh, or should not be seen together and gives rise to uh, disease outcomes. Okay, so in the remaining uh, uh, five minutes or so, what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about our current research and uh, conclude my talk by uh, putting together uh, where exactly disordered regions fit into the larger context of how organismal diversity and complexity emerges in nature. Now, as we all seen, uh, intrinsically disordered regions are quite prevalent and functional. More than 40% of eukaryotic genomes contain these disordered regions and they can contribute to different functions via motifs or modification sites and so on. And they've also been implicated in diseases such as cancer and neurodegeneration. And therefore, there is an enormous opportunity uh, for these proteins to be studied in great detail and untapped potential for developing novel applications if we identify what are the functional regions within these disordered segments. Now, with this objective in mind, what we uh, are doing currently in our group is to be able to come up with a high throughput technology or a platform that allows us to identify and discover these functional elements that can contribute to a function of interest. So this approach, which we call IDR-seq for intrinsically disordered region sequencing, exploits next-gen sequencing technology to un uh, understand and identify regions that are important for protein function. So this is a project that is being uh, um, um, spearheaded by Charles Ravarani, a postdoc in the group, and Pavitra Chawali, Greet, and Alex are members of the group who are using this to address different questions. So there are two different phases to this approach. There's an experimental phase and a computational phase. And within the experimental phase, there are three major steps. The first step is to design a selection system for a function of interest. And the second step is to generate a library of all possible disordered regions from a genome of interest. It could be a virus, it could be a, a, a yeast, or it could be different parts of the human proteome, and so on. And once you generate this library, you then uh, subject them to the selection system and identify which variants are able to be selected for a particular function of interest. And then using next-gen sequencing, before you send them through the selection and after you send them through the selection, you identify which regions uh, can contribute to the function that you are selecting for. Now, in the computational phase, you can then look at all the sequences that survived your selection screen and then ask what are unusual about these uh, disordered segments that are able to undergo this selection system. And in this manner, you could then use approaches such as machine learning to discover new motifs or potential modification sites and also perform the same experiments in different genetic background or experimental conditions to be able to identify and discover which genes can modulate their function and hence gain a better understanding of uh, what are the function elements uh, within disordered regions that could contribute to a function of interest. So in this manner, we hope that IDR-seq as a platform will help us discover functional regions of uncharacterized disordered protein segments from different organisms and also help us to define and identify the rules by which these uh, uh, disordered regions make them functional or to be able to perform certain functions. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to um, uh, take a step back and try to put together um, where exactly protein disorder fits into the broader context of a pursuit to understand the mechanisms and for uh, our ability to understand how organismal diversity and complexity is created in nature. Now, if you look at what are the major mechanisms uh, that contributes to the evolution of organismal diversity and complexity, uh, the first major mechanism is that you create new genes for instance, by gene duplication. And in this manner, you create new proteins, you create new components, uh, new proteins can perform new functions, and therefore organisms can be more complex, and you can generate diversity by making new genes or creating new genes. Now, in 1975, King and Wilson compared the sequences of human and chimpanzee and suggested that in addition to creating new genes, you could also change the way in which you control these genes, meaning that when do you switch them on, when do you switch them off. Uh, and you can use the same components dif at different points in time, and this could also give rise to uh, complexity and organismal diversity. 
Now, in the era of systems biology, it is now also becoming clear that you could increase uh, organismal diversity and complexity by changing the ways in which the same genes are connected. So, by rewiring protein networks, you could also give rise to new phenotypes and this has been seen by how small alterations to which proteins can interact can generate differences in the kinds of phenotypes that you can observe. So, you could either create new components, you could control which components to use or you could connect the same components differently and all three are mechanisms by which you could increase the functional diversity and give rise to uh, organismal complexity. So, in addition to the number of proteins that are encoded by the genome of an organism, when the proteins are made and how they are connected actually matters. So, where does protein disorder fit into this broader picture? Now, in the framework of the genotype determining a network of interactions and the network of interactions determining a phenotype, disordered regions occupy a very special position because small number of mutations within protein coding genes uh, of disordered segments can very rapidly and quickly rewire in a large scale the network of interactions that these proteins can mediate. So, you could either make new connections or disrupt new connections with a very small number of mutations and then that, that can change the kind of phenotypes that you could generate. Hence, protein disorder can generate diversity with just a small number of mutations upon which natural selection can then operate to decide whether these rewiring is functional or not functional. So, in this manner, disordered regions accelerate the exploration of the genotype to phenotype landscape through rapid rewiring of protein networks. And this essentially means that protein disorder is actually a very powerful medium that can fuel the evolution of organismal complexity and diversity through the creation of new and novel networks of interaction. Uh, what I would also like to uh, comment at this point is that I do not mean to say that disordered regions is more important than structured domains or vice versa, but it is actually the synergy between disordered regions and structured domains that increases the functional versatility of these proteins. So, disordered regions on their own is probably going to be uh, less functional. Structured domains which can have very clearly defined biochemical activity, but that cannot be regulated is probably also not a good idea. So, the combination of the synergy between having a certain disordered region with a structured domain that can be regulated provides the flexibility to be able to use a particular biochemical function in a specific context. So, if structured domain contributes to the biochemical function, disordered regions contributes to the context in which the biochemical function can be used and therefore, through small number of mutations you can very rapidly change the context in which the same biochemical activity can be uh, uh, realized and thus uh, uh, lead to uh, complexity and diversity. So, as a parting thought, I wanted to show this video which essentially is a daily scene on a road in an Indian city which highlights how despite the massive amount of disorder, order can still prevail. Yeah, so if you are on the road, you know, you might probably think that there is no order whatsoever, but then if you look at it long enough and from an aerial view, it kind of like becomes clear how we can see patterns emerge and how the vehicles interact with each other and that allows them to actually navigate the roads quite safely. And this is very similar to what happens in cells in some instance. Okay, so with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and I'd like to acknowledge a number of group members and colleagues and coworkers who contributed to a variety of the projects that I described. First, I'd like to thank Maria Bullion, uh, who did all the calculations that I described in the project on alternative splicing. I'd also like to thank Guillaume Shalankon, Sebastian Oysterman, Gunter Wagner, Monika Fuchsreiter, and Alex Bateman for their contribution to this project. So, the work that I described about uh, uh, gene fusion was spearheaded by a graduate student, Natasha Latisheva. I'd also like to thank Maria Bullion, Rob Weatherit, Tillman Flock, Louis Maddox, and our collaborators, Julian Goff and Matt Oates, for the contribution to this work. I'd also, like to uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all my present and past group members without whom you know, um, none of this work would have been possible. I'd also like to thank a number of funding agencies for supporting our work over the last decade or so. I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge several of my uh, mentors. In particular, I'd like to thank Sarah Teichman, who was my PhD advisor and a mentor. 
Arvind, who was my postdoc advisor, and Cyrus, who has been a great mentor for me for a large number of years. I'd also like to thank specifically Venki, Veronica, Tom, and Michael, and my former teachers, collaborators, and colleagues, and again, specifically Venki, Jan, David, Kiyoshi, Richard Henderson, and Hugh Pelham for actively supporting my research at the LMB, and the Medical Research Council in particular, without which none of the work that I described would have been possible. And last but not the least, I'd also like to thank my family, my father, my mother, my sister, and my wife, uh, specifically for also helping me structure some of these ideas in an otherwise disordered talk. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. That you have. Well, there you go. We have time for some questions. Yeah, Lawrence Barron, Glasgow University. First, thank you for a wonderful presentation of this uh, burgeoning new area of protein science. I wanted to comment that these so-called um, disordered sequences and, and proteins are not completely disordered. It's now recognized that a very common structural mo motif in them is something called polyproline 2 helix, which is an extended left-handed helix stabilized by hydrogen bonding That's to right. water. Yeah. It lives in on, just adjacent to the beta region on the Ramachandran surface, oh, yeah. and it's been shown to interconvert very easily That's with right. alpha helix, for example. Right. So it's beautifully set up to snap in. I, I call it a, a careful disorderliness, yeah. I've, yeah. I've called it. Um, so. But it has a dark side because it's very s close to beta strand. Um, in conformation. So th when things get out of kilter, like um, uh, mutations changing this balance of hydrophobicity and charge and That's whatnot, right. then it's perfectly set up to associate into beta sheet. And, right. and it has been identified in um, uh, protein states, fibrillogenic protein states, in fact. Um, so, you know, so. You know, I just want to say these disordered sequences, it's not random coil, it's not yes. completely No, thank disordered. you for bringing this up. Yeah. In fact, that's the same point that I wanted to make in, in some of my slides. You have a huge spectrum of different conformations that uh, many of these disordered regions can take. And some specific instances can have intrinsic secondary structure, but they don't autonomously fold into a defined tertiary structure. So this doesn't mean that, uh, uh, like you pointed out, they don't have any intrinsic secondary structure. But what I wanted to highlight is that they don't uh, collapse or spontaneously fold into defined tertiary structures. Well, polyproline 2 helix is a sort of secondary structure, in yeah. fact. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it can adopt secondary structure, but, but not like not, a tertiary but it, but structure between. It doesn't between. have internal hydrogen bonds. It's stabilized yeah. by water. So it has this, this, um, th this flexibility, that's this right. careful mm -hmm. disorderliness. Yeah. Any more? I mean, in the in 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 your evolution part, yes. Do you detect uh, increases in disorder as, let's say, selection happens against an interaction? Yes. So I think um, what we have observed and others have also observed is that when you have organismal complexity, you have increase in the amount of disorder, but you also have polymorphisms that tend to avoid disordered regions because these are functional motifs that can contribute to. Um, you know, being able to interact with a certain protein. So there is evolution for and against right. uh, disordered regions. So there is positive selection, and there is also negative selection to prevent an existing motif uh, within a population, for instance. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the unstructured. Could you say your name, please? Uh, Samyo Nyakana. Uh, you mentioned that unstructured proteins are prevalent to. Uh, in, oh, they are sort of organ specific, yes. uh, and they're a result of uh, mutational changes that lead to different proteins forming. Would that uh, follow on that you'll find these disordered or unstructured proteins more prevalent in, in an older in an older individual than a younger person? Yeah. Uh, and which organs would you think? the most prevalent, apart from the neurogenerative diseases you've given? Yeah, so 
I mean, we haven't done this research, but David Jones here from University College London has looked at different amounts of uh, uh, proteins that have been expressed in different tissues. And they've seen that the brain does express a large amount of disordered proteins compared to most of the other tissues. And um, uh, there have also been studies which have shown that with age, there is a change in the uh, disorder content of the protein that gets expressed. Uh, and that is uh, correlated with also decrease in the expression of, for instance, proteins such as chaperones. So these are the, the general trends that people have looked at in terms of which tissue you have more amount of disorder and whether there is a change in the amount of disordered proteins that are expressed uh, as you age, for instance. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One is, um, in some cases, you can actually create function where a disordered region helps some larger entity to fold. And I'm right. particularly thinking of ribosomal proteins, which have these long tails, uh, tails without which the RNA couldn't fold right. into a structure. Yeah. So uh, it, it's not just involved in regulation. It yes. may also of be course. actually involved in creating activity. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the other question was, um, you mentioned that fusion proteins the probability of finding a fusion protein is somehow related to whether it's a hub in a network or not. Yeah. I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, I think the event is happening at the DNA level. So yes. fusion probably happens without any uh, real selection for but what proteins get picked up in these studies is causing cancer. Right. Yeah, so, so I didn't mean to exactly say, yeah, I mean. absolutely. Yeah. Right. So okay. the event happens at the DNA level. So there's no knowledge at the DNA level whether a protein is a hub or not. But what gets selected and may cause disease uh, are those subsets of fusion yes. proteins that so may cause. Absolutely, up absolutely, yeah. So that's what uh, uh, we observed, and then we mapped it back uh, rather than rather than the other way. Yeah. There was a question there. Um, you mentioned about. Could you say who you are, please? Uh, Amina Hassan from uh, just a student. Um, so about the uh, <coughs> gene fusion that could that have been identified to cause cancer, yeah. certain types of cancer, would it are they specific to specific cancers? And could uh, with your experimentation and your research, could you eventually maybe find a cure by, for example, creating the genes uh, responsible that no, could that, regulate uh, these? Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question because it takes me to uh, another active area of research in the field, which is are these disordered proteins druggable? Because most proteins that adopt a defined shape, you can define or identify small molecules that can go and bind to them and regulate their activity. For many of these fusion proteins, there is a new um, um, approach that scientists are developing to be able to specifically target disordered regions, for instance. And the way by which they do this is to create a fusion compound where one of the part of the compound can bind to a structured region of a disordered fusion protein, for instance, and the second part of the compound can bring uh, a protein called as the E3 ligase. So E3 ligase is an enzyme that can ubiquitinate a protein, and that leads the protein to be destroyed. So you don't have to stoichiometrically prevent a structured region using a small molecule, but you could now, using a small molecule, enzymatically control the abundance of this fusion product of the disordered protein. So this is a possibility uh, that uh, many scientists are trying to um, regulate, for instance, otherwise difficult proteins to target using conventional approaches. And in this manner, therefore, fusion proteins and products could also be um, you know, uh, used as targets for, um, for destruction or, or removing them from cells. Uh, Louis Maddox, um, Benevolent AI. Uh, thanks for your talk, Madan. Um, would you be able to say a bit more about the machine learning approaches related to the IDR seq, which you mentioned, which were also you discussed in the interview recently? Thank you. Yeah, so once you actually have um, from a library of sequences, a subset of them which are, um, which are actually functional through your functional screen, then you can have like a, a gold standard positive and gold standard negative and apply uh, machine learning approaches like decision tree. So you can create a bunch of features that describe a disordered segment. It could be amino acid content, patterns of amino acids, or motifs, or physical chemical property of a segment. And then use these as input features and ask what classifies them 
successfully as um, uh, being able to fall into this group that can function compared to the group that does not function. And because you use next-gen sequencing technology, the abundance of the reads can also tell you about the amount of function that they can contribute. So it need not be just a binary classification of, yes, this region can function, this region can't function. But you also have potential information about how much of uh, function can actually be um, uh, contributed by this sequence. So you could still use that information in different ways uh, to um, identify or even like you know, tune the sequences um, to have uh, different extents of function. So these are the kinds of approaches that you could do. And you should really talk to Charles because uh, he and Greet are working very hard on this problem too. And they could also have very interesting insights on how exactly you, know, you could use machine learning approaches. Um, hi, I'm Luke Dabin from uh, University College London. Um, you touched very briefly on neurodegeneration. Yeah. Um, using, I think, alpha synuclein as the yeah. example of the disordered protein. So if we look at most neurodegenerative diseases, there's a very protein-heavy focus to the root of the pathology. In Alzheimer's, you have amyloid beta precursor protein and yeah. microtubule-associated protein tau, which are very flexible. They have disordered domains in their yeah. natural conformation. But the pathology is associated with the adoption of a pathogenic conformation, That's which right. is very highly ordered. Yes. So I wondered if you could comment on how disorder what sort of role protein disorder has in those pathologies? Roughly? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, that's a, a very interesting point because, <laughs> in fact, for most proteins that are fully folded, unfolding them causes disease. The reason is because, you know, they expose hydrophobic residues and they can actually uh, form these aggregate-like structures like in ALS and so on. But uh, in the case of uh, disordered proteins, making them hydrophobic uh, can actually make them sticky. And now in this particular case, it's the stickiness to be able to interact with self rather than with a completely different protein that leads to these uh, amyloid or organized uh, structures. But you can, you can still have a spectrum or a variety of different outcomes. So there are some disordered proteins which can now sequester all the other chaperones into aggregates. And it could be a loss of function uh, due to the inability or lack of availability of chaperones that could cause the actual disease because you know, uh, uh, affect the entire cell in terms of its ability for normal proteins to be able to fold without the requirement of the chaperone. So this is some work from Ulrich Hartl which has highlighted this aspect. So there, the disordered proteins can form an amorphous aggregate. It need not be an ordered uh, amyloid aggregate. And this amorphous aggregate can actually sequester uh, other proteins uh, into, these, um, into these kind of plaques and thus cause what is called as transient loss of function phenotype. Now, many other disordered proteins have also been described to undergo a phenomena called as phase separation, where they are actively able to form higher order assemblies that are not amyloid aggregates, but when you have a disordered region with multiple motifs, uh, structured domains can go and bind them in different regions and they could form a mesh-like structure. So under a normal microscope, they look like an aggregate, but if you look at the microstructure, they're not amyloid aggregates, but these are multivalent interactions between different proteins. And because these are uh, multivalent interactions, you could regulate them very, very rapidly and dynamically by changing the half-life of these proteins. So you could arrange and organize proteins in space purely by um, this phenomenon called this phase separation. So, uh, I haven't touched upon that aspect in the interest of time, but that's another very active area of research where, which is called as functional aggregates or functional amyloids, so which don't cause disease, but these are integral part of normal functioning of these cells. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna stop it there. Thank you very much, Madame. Thank you again. John. I think uh, that. <laughs> It's now my uh, great pleasure to present the <laughs> scroll Thank you. and the award and the Crick Medal. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you.